Good afternoon. I am Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my honor to welcome you to this speaker series event. A conversation with His Excellency Mr. Shahadul Haq, Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh, addressing the Rohingya humanitarian crisis. Uh, Mr. Secretary, before just before now, said don't don't give a big introduction of my bio and such, but I, but I can't resist saying a few things. Um, Mr. Haq has been serving as Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh since January 2013. And prior to assuming this post, he occupied several senior positions at the International Organization for Migration. Um, more recently, Secretary Haq has served as chair of the ninth Global Forum on Migration and Development, and is currently serving his second term as independent expert to the UN Committee on the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Family. Presently, he has been leading the work of the government of Bangladesh to address the needs of the recent refugees from Myanmar. So he has extensive both bilateral and multilateral experience. Uh, welcome in this room. Given this extensive experience, Mr. Haq is ideally situated to provide us with the view from the region of the current crisis. This crisis, this monumental tragedy, uh, that we have all been watching closely, challenges the very core of the international system. The atrocities have been condemned in the strongest terms by senior UN leadership and others. But notwithstanding the fact that the precarious situation of the Rohingya in Myanmar has been on the radar of the UN system and independent experts really for years, the crisis has done nothing if not yet again highlight the limits and constraints of international action. We all believe we can and must do better, but um, how? Currently, uh, we'll be focusing on the humanitarian response, and Bangladesh is at the center of that response. By one measure, the government-run settlements in Cox's Bazar now represent the largest refugee camps in the world, an incredible statistic when you consider the numbers involved. And they continue to grow. As all refugee camps, they are not uh, meant to be long-term solutions to the problem, but we know these things take time, more and more time. Refugee camps require services, shelter, sanitation, education for the young. The goal is to organize the voluntary, safe, dignified, and sustainable return home of the Rohingya population. But if one theme emerged from Tuesday's Security Council briefing on the situation in Myanmar, it is that the situation remains tense, and the Rohingya remain at extreme risk. As UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grande, said in his briefing to the Council, the conditions for voluntary return do not exist. So much work is left to be done, not least of which is to prepare for the monsoon season. Mr. Grande estimated that upwards of 100,000 refugees are living in flood-prone areas. But I'm not the one who is well-placed to brief you on uh, all that and more. That is why we are fortunate to have the Foreign Secretary here. Mr. Hack will speak for 15 to 20 minutes. He has a, a presentation prepared. And then uh, we will come back here. Uh, I might take the liberty to ask a couple questions myself. And then we'll open the floor. We should have uh, plenty of time for Q&A uh, following. Mr. Secretary, the floor is yours. Good morning. For the last uh, couple of days and nights, I've been uh, flying from city to city. Uh, I just came last night from uh, from Rome after Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's visit uh, to Rome, to Ifad, and also audience with uh, uh, with the Pope. So, if I sound disjointed. Uh, inconsistent, please forgive me. Uh, because in Bangladesh, uh, it is uh, middle of night. <laughs> uh, 
the way I uh, thought that I will share uh, the situation of Rohingyas in, in Bangladesh is uh, give you a quick uh, background, give you a figure, move into uh, the issues of challenges. And uh, towards the end, I will try and share as to what we think should be the next for the international community to do. Uh, there's no doubt that Bangladesh, both the government and the people, are facing formidable challenge. We have never uh, been to such a situation where one million Rohingyas crossed over to Bangladesh within a very short period of two months. Uh, this is where it is. Uh, it is in the Bay of Bengal, uh, in the Indian Ocean. And those who are closely monitoring uh, the situation right now in Maldives and other places, see how volatile this region is. I come from the discipline of uh, international relations. But today I'll not talk about geopolitics, but there's also a geopolitics of this mobility that we need to keep in mind. Uh, this is kind of an initial flow. That's how they crossed over. They crossed over through land and through river, which is called Naf River. So um, they left everything, just whatever they're wearing or not wearing. Thank you. This is what, this is not the first time that Bangladesh is uh, facing uh, Rohingya flow from uh, across the border. Uh, it started off in 77, 78 and 79. At that time, about 230,000. It's all right. It's all right. 230,000 uh, Rohingyas came across. Through a bilateral arrangement, UNHCR help. They went back. Then again, there was a flow in 91 and 92, about 250,000. Some of those people went back and some continue to stay in the refugee camp and that's why in the bottom there are 34,000 registered refugees in the camp registered by the UNHCR. They remain in Bangladesh. And in between 95 and 2005, we see a gradual flow. Five families, two families, one families. There's a continuous flow of, uh, uh, of Rohingyas uh, crossing over. And that accumulated over the years, and we did a census, and that is 300,000. So 300,000, 34,000, 34, and then we uh, started receiving a huge f flow, in fact, last year from Og October till today. In fact, last week, we had about 3,000 fresh arrival. So it continues. It, it never uh, ended. So that's where we have 1.1 million Rohingyas on our land. Bangladesh is the largest, uh, in Cox's is the largest camp. Ahead of uh, even the dub, which we uh, are aware of it. This has created a multi-dimensional and a multi-layered problem for us. When they came in, in August, we thought it is only a humanitarian issues. Uh, so they have to be given shelter, food, and the rest of it. But gradually, we uh, see that it became a security issue, environmental issue, social issue, and a political issue. Despite the fact that there is no conflict between Bangladesh and Myanmar, it has ne there has never been a conflict between the two countries. It is an issue between Myanmar and their own nationals. We happens to be hosting Myanmar people in Bangladesh. So that's the problem. It's not between Bangladesh and Myanmar, right? despite uh, all kinds of provocation that we. If there are questions, I'll be. Why it is multi layered? When they initially they came in, there were certain kind of an issues and problem. Now gradually, we see there are other related uh, problems, both geopolitical and humanitarian, which is gradually unfolding as a bigger picture of the Indian Ocean politics. 
So that's why it is multi-layered. Uh, when they came in, how we responded? We had a huge debate when they started coming in. On the initial first and second day, I think the border security forces were not sure as to how they will respond. So naturally, they put a barrier for their entry into Bangladesh. Most of them were staying in the zero line. We, we had uh, our internal meetings, and our Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, decided that uh, we will have to let them come in. And uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, we will uh, we'll welcome them. And some of the discussions that I was privy to, and I'll share with you, she said in 71, when we were in a similar kind of a situation, those who know the history, we, 10 million of Bangladeshis crossed over to India. And India gave shelter to Bangladesh. If India refused to give shelter to 10 millions of Bangladeshis in those days, some of us wouldn't have been here. So that should be the single rationale for us to let the Rohingyas come in. She also said that when her father was assassinated in 1975, along with the whole family, she took shelter in Germany as a refugee. So she said, I know the pain and suffering of a refugee. And some of you also know the pain and suffering of the refugees. Let open the border. And the border remains open as of today. Uh, we also provided unhindered access to the UN and humanitarian agencies and the media for the first time. In the past, we did not allow others to come and see an issue, a phenomena between the two countries. We, but this time around, I think we, 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 we decided that others should come and see what has happened to the Rohingyas. The Rohingya populations, 58% children, overwhelming presence of children. 30,000 women are pregnant. And then 36,000 are orphan. And out of that, 7,777 children have lost both the parents. Now the question is where they have lost the parents and where they are. I think we, we can uh, we can make out, and I don't want to go into details. So when they came, that particular area that I showed you is deep forest land for Bangladesh. So they literally took over the forest land. And if you go now, you'll see not a single tree standing. So we have lost about 5,000 acres of uh, deep forest in Bangladesh. That is an environmental shock for us, especially for the people who are living there. Uh, we have, uh, this time, uh, did registrations with the help of UNICEF, uh, registered all of them upon their arrival. Uh, Prime Minister decided that she will uh, make a brief reference to the humanitarian crisis of Rohingyas in the UNGA for the first time. Despite the fact for the last three decades we have been dealing with it, but we never brought this to the UN. But after looking at the misery and the abuses and the atrocities that has been committed is the uh, Rohingyas, she decided that we will bring this to the UNGA, calling for a five-point agenda, where she said that you have to create a safe zone within uh, Myanmar, guarded by the UN forces, for them to go back. So that is still on the agenda. On the seventh day of the arrival, Prime Minister, against the um, strong opposition of his own security forces, decided to go and uh, see Rohingyas. That was, uh, that was something uh, to, uh, I think, um, you know, she cried a number of times, looking at uh, these people. Uh, this has happened to the forest land. There's nothing standing. This is the satellite picture of the impact before and after. Now, currently there are new crises. Some related to the monsoon and some related to assistance. 
during the monsoon because the forest has been cleared the likelihood of a landslide where the rohingyas are currently staying there could be cyclone because that's the cyclone prone area next to bay of bengal and the flood and that is why we have a different kind of a challenge and you must have been reading in the paper as to how they are uh, reacting the second issue that we are challenged we are the, now facing is the whole issue of assistance there seems to be uh, less interest in helping out the rohingyas now the un uh, has developed a joint response plan but uh, there's not uh, too much contribution coming into into that which uh, could eventually lead uh, a lead into a difficult circumstances so in order to do something uh, during the monsoon we uh, decided to let our military go and create a, uh, a road uh, through the middle of the camp so that emergencies could um, reach so this is uh, the military is currently building the road so that uh, their uh, various kinds of assistance could be sent during difficult uh, times especially monsoon our policy our policy uh, this time is a mix of bilateral and multilateral in the past we have absolutely followed bilateral we have never brought this to the un or a multilateral forum but this time we have uh, we have done so and uh, also kept uh, the uh, the windows of uh, our our uh, negotiation with myanmar open uh, if there are questions we will be very happy to uh, answer uh, as to how we are combining the two uh, the instruments that has so far been signed there are three instruments uh, uh, these are the three actually there's two instrument and one joint working group to look at repatriation and uh, um, and rights issues in in rohingya from the last two set of negotiation in 78 uh, 79 and 91 92 we realized that we have to uh, also look at Uh, the uh, uh, the issue of how myanmar treats its own nationals because earlier we thought once they take back it is their responsibility as to how they deal with their their population but this time we said no that has to be also discussed and put into our arrangements and that's why we have attached uh, not only return but also resettlement and reintegration and these are some of the things that we included after long long negotiations you know it's strange that why bangladesh has to negotiate rights issues with a country about whose population we are talking about so it's, it's, it's kind of a strange situation and if there are questions I'll, i'll answer now what next atrocities has to stop and no more repetition of that that myanmar has to commit to its own people not to not to us there's an anan commission kofi anan commission's report you know uh, and uh, there's a series of recommendations uh, kofi anan commission was set up by government of myanmar it includes some international staff and the national uh, of myanmar and the whole world wants that report to be implemented because in there also and it relates to not the ndaka and no, nothing else not the bigger myanmar issue there's a issue of citizenship as you know that in 1982 myanmar's citizenship were taken away rohingyas were left with a red card subsequently with a white card and now no card that's how they have been deprived of their citizenship <coughs> excuse me we also want international community to remain alert and seized with it i know there are a number of crises currently going on there are more in the in the offing but these people cannot be forgotten i we have been telling the myanmar authorities that why do you treat the rohingyas as a part of the problem of your nation building they they are they have been in the past and they will continue to be a source of your nation building those who know the history there were ministers there were professors from the rohingya community who have served 
the greater Burma. Currently, there's a major general retired in, 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 uh, in Bangladesh, took shelter, because he was also faced with the same abuse. So this is a, recently uh, the special rapporteur was in Dhaka, uh, and also uh, in uh, uh, in Cox's Bazaar, she was refused access to the northern Rakhine, and she came out with uh, with her own assessment, part of it, um, as to how we are trying uh, uh, to help the distressed people. The question remains: Aren't international community should answer and seek justice from the people who have done this? to their own nationals. That's the bigger question. Bangladesh alone cannot ensure that. It is the responsibility of the international community to seek justice on behalf of the Myanmar, on behalf of the Rohingyas from the Myanmar. I'll leave this slide here. Thank you. So, well, thank you very much for that, that presentation, Mr. Secretary. Um, uh, in particular, I think uh, one thing that I was struck um, by is the multi-dimensional nature of the challenge uh, for Bangladesh. Um, one thing that I certainly was did not appreciate um, is, in particular, the environmental impact of the uh, of the crisis. Um, one, if, if you don't mind, ask a couple questions before we go to the floor. Uh, could you, you mentioned the burden on the host community, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about how the uh, host communities in the area have been uh, responding um, and what is the current uh, status of relations there? Um, in, in terms of uh, uh, the local uh, community there, this, this ring are concentrated in two sub-districts. And in both the sub district there are more Rohingyas than local people. So local people overnight has become a minority, number one. Number two, all the schools have been closed because schools have been taken over by Rohingyas. So uh, the normal schooling has come to a uh, halt. Now, although government is currently trying to make some um, makeshift arrangements for uh, the students to go back to their school is, is very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how many of you have been to uh, Cox's Bazaar, uh, that area. Anyone? Well, there are a number of them. So you know what, I, uh, what I'm saying. Uh, it's, it's pretty crowded. Uh, their, um, um, their, um, their petty field has been taken over. Uh, and uh, uh, Initially, I think, uh, and uh, still now people are not making an issue out of it. We are also now trying to help them, uh, the local host communities, in terms of some assistance, which we did not think in the early stage. Also, I know the UN system is, is, is trying to help when they are helping and the, uh, and the Rohingyas. So far, touch wood, uh, no issue. Uh, uh, but uh, we don't know uh, because we have seen in other places uh, things can uh, go extremely uh, uh, difficult. Yeah. But so far, yeah. okay. no issue. Well, very good. Um, just you mentioned uh, briefly the bilateral agreement between Myanmar and Bangladesh to facilitate the voluntary return. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the current status of that agreement? Um, and also in, in the briefing to the council on Tuesday, Filippo Grande um, mentioned his wish that any final repatriation agreement should be tripartite between uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, and UNHCR. Um, what role do you, does Bangladesh envision for UNHCR? What are they uh, in the coming months, in the future? You mentioned international assistance has been declining. Uh, has there been a formal appeal uh, what what sort of assistance are you looking for? Uh, on the issue of uh, UNHCR's involvement in in, uh, in the repatriation, uh, from Bangladesh side, we uh, did uh, propose, we strongly argued uh, that uh, there has to be an engagement of UNHCR or any other agency that Myanmar thinks 
uh, uh, is acceptable to them. Uh, they have, in the uh, um, bilateral agreement, uh, agreed uh, that Bangladesh will engage UNHCR right from day one. Uh, about their uh, engagement, they said at an appropriate time. On that, we, we did have a long negotiation. We wanted a time-bound commitment from Myanmar. They did not agree to that. Instead of that, they were talking about ICRC. They said uh, they would engage ICRC instead of UNHCR. But they would certainly let us know uh, when that happens. So uh, uh, the tripartite agreement from our side, there is no issue. In fact, we have been arguing for that. But from um, Myanmar side, uh, there's a no-go area. Absolutely no-go area. In fact, uh, I recall spending almost full morning on this particular uh, issue, engagement of international uh, <clears throat> staff, international organizations in the repatriation. But one thing towards the end they agreed. I said, could we talk of international community uh, uh, instead of UN? A a international community means uh, if you think that uh, you're, you can involve China or India or Japan or Indonesia, Malaysia, how about that? And there seems to be little open on that, that we could have uh, these members of these countries or representative of these countries involved in the tripartite. So that window is there uh, without mentioning any name. Uh, they have promised that in the next March uh, consultative meeting, they will, they will try and share with us that which international organization, which international uh, bodies uh, they would welcome and how they will welcome. Mm. Uh, with the, in the absence of that, we have already uh, done one um, initial uh, MOU with uh, UNESCO, and uh, the final one is uh, the more comprehensive UNESCO Bangladesh uh, MOU for uh, return repatriation issues is finalized. Uh, I think there's one or two points that they're checking with their headquarter. I think the, the moment I go back, we should be able to sign it. Mm. Am I correct? We have the DG UN who <laughs> has it, so she's, she's nodding. So that's, from our side, arrangements have been done. From Myanmar's side, only Allah knows when it will happen. Mm. Mm. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Could have uh, many more questions, but I think we, uh, we've got a packed house here, so I want to be sure that people have Plenty of uh, opportunities. I think we'll we'll collect a number of questions if you don't mind, and then before we come back to you, and we should have time for uh, uh, several uh, rounds. Uh, yes, here in the third row, and then we'll come over here. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, how are the I, I I I have a name. Oh, that's called Shahid. So let's let's use the name. Yes, uh, Shaheen, my name not is Shirley anything. Chesney. Yes, yes, sir. Please uh, introduce yourselves uh, for the for the webcast for uh, this meeting. I've uh, been an NGO uh, for several years, and in 2015, I was approached. I was approached in 2015 by uh, two or three men who were Rohingya people, who were feeling very desperate because they were bringing a letter addressed to the Secretary General and they couldn't cross the street. Um, they gave me this letter and I never knew where, whether it ever got to the Secretary General. But what I'm asking is how are the Rohingya organized themselves? What is their leadership? Who negotiates from their own people with you and the so-called international community. Thank you. Good question. Uh, here in the first okay. row here. We'll take a few and yes. gather them yes. and then, yeah. Uh, my name is Ram. I am from Princeton area. My question is, uh, does um, any country or any countries, including UN, have any authority relative to any kind of a financial or embargo against Myanmar? Mm. Right. Very to the point, thanks. And then we're not here in the fourth row, and then we'll come back to the secretary. Yes, sir. thank you. I'm uh, the French uh, DPR. Uh, first, Mr. Secretary, I wanted to really uh, pay tribute to uh, the generosity of Bangladesh in, in hosting half a million of refugees uh, since uh, last August. It's uh, you really have our full uh, 
admiration and, and support. Uh, as you know, France has been very mobilized both in the Security Council, in the GA, um, on, on, this, on this crisis, which is one of the most serious uh, human rights and uh, humanitarian crisis um, that, that we have to deal with today. Actually, we are witnessing ethnic, ethnic cleansing. Um, and so you can count on us to keep uh, the issue uh, very high on the agenda. We had um, you know, a meeting two days ago, and Filippo Grandi um, drew the attention on, 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 on many of the issues that you also raised today. My first question is on the uh, situation in Cox Bazar. You, um, you warned us about the risks uh, involved by the monsoon and, uh, and, uh, and the risk of landslide. Um, you know, uh, I'd like to know what uh, are the mitigation measures that, that can be uh, taken uh, and what can the international community do uh, to help in, uh, in, in, this, in this regard. Uh, so, you know, both an assessment of, of, the situa of, of the risks and of the, uh, of, of the measures. And the second question is, is more of a, of a longer term question. It, it is about the, the risk uh, of radicalization of, of, the, um, of the population uh, if uh, their uh, basic uh, needs uh, are not uh, uh, addressed. And, and here, you know, again, you know, what, what can we do? How, how should we handle this? Thank you. Thank Great. you. Thanks. Thanks. A lot of on the, on the table. I think you can yeah, respond good. to those. Um, mm -hmm. The first question, how are they organized? They're not organized. They don't, they're, they're not organized. I don't know why. Uh, as a social scientist, I have asked this question number of again, that they have been going through this marginalization, abuse, and uh, all kinds of uh, deprivations for three decades. Why weren't they uh, thought of organizing themselves uh, even in terms of raising voice, if not uh, anything else. I, I think that uh, that needs a research as to, they, they never thought of organizing and standing up and saying this is what is our right. Despite the fact they had, they had ministers, they had remembered the parliament from this. One possible uh, answer could be that they were under so much of a, uh, I'm trying to find a proper sen uh, word. Uh, let's put it as a situation. They were in a situation where they never thought of raising their head. They knew that if they raise head, they'll be, uh, they'll be slaughtered. So simple fear factor. Number two is, if the opportunity for education is very limited. Uh, what is available, and I have been to that area twice, uh, northern Rakhine, there are mosques. So they sort of learn and grow up uh, only reading uh, and, and reciting Quran, most of them. So the normal education, uh, they don't have an education is, uh, is something which teaches you to, uh, to respond uh, under these circumstances. Uh, even after coming back to, to Bangladesh, when we asked them that, what do you want to do? Uh, you know, uh, they, uh, they say we want to go back to Burma land. For them, it is a Burma land. So, you know, after so much of uh, uh, atrocities, so much of an abuse, why do you want to go to Burma land? Because they, 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 they do not know any other possible way to respond to such a situation. It, it sounds very, uh, uh, very messy, very uh, strange, but that's what it is. So when uh, we hear that they have been organizing this uh, terrorist group and that terrorist group, I, I don't know what uh, the Myanmar government is talking about. If they were organized, if they had that kind of an orientation, possibly things uh, would have been different. I haven't said anything. Um, the, the second question is the financial embargo. I think European Union uh, did uh, uh, put in uh, embargo on individual generals. So is the United States. Uh, so that's there. but. Uh, if you allow me, and I'll be very frank on, I know that uh, it's, it's an open channel, uh, but 
when uh, Aung San Suu Kyi came to power, uh, three months into into the power, uh, we went uh, for a foreign office consultations, and I saw that uh, the Yangon is flooded with uh, all kinds of business people. I mean, it was very difficult to even get a hotel because everybody was rushing to do business. Uh, and uh, we had a different uh, explanation to this. Uh, all the embargoes uh, that were there were lifted one fine morning. And, uh, and that, whether that contributed to the situation that we are currently in or not, that somebody has to do a research. On the, um, I think I have given a direct and indirect. <laughs> yeah. uh, in terms of uh, 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 French support, we are grateful to France for taking up the issue during your chairmanship in the Security Council. Also, our Prime Minister was invited uh, uh, by your President, Macron, a month back. Uh, they had a long discussion on this. Uh, he was very committed, both in terms of financial support, also politically. So that was something uh, very encouraging to see. And I was privy to the, uh, to the discussion. So uh, thank you for, the, for that. Uh, in terms of monsoon mitigations, I have already showed you as to we have already deployed the military to build a road so that emergency could be reached. We are also uh, thinking of, um, in, in fact, it is 12,000 to 20,000 people who are vulnerable in terms of flood and cyclones. They are living on the steps. Uh, we will possibly have to bring them down and uh, get them uh, to a flat land to avoid this, which uh, currently been uh, discussed and, and, and considered. Now, the question is, Every time we want to bring down the trees, we have to go to the cabinet to get an approval. Because in Bangladesh, because of the environmental concern, uh, the, the forest area, which has been declared as a forest area, cannot be, uh, uh, cannot be uh, cleared of forests unilaterally, by, even by the government officials. We have to seek a cabinet approval, telling them how many trees would be, would be chopped, for what purpose. So that's what currently being uh, done. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, Bangladesh government, with the help of um, the international community, especially UN, would be able to uh, uh, put in uh, quite a bit, good mitigation uh, area. We, we have been discussing this for the last one month and did put in some, uh, some measures. On the issue of uh, radicalization, it's there. Of course it is there. You know, Think of a situation where, when you grow up as a children, uh, memorizing one particular book, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a difficult uh, proposition. So uh, we are uh, in the camp uh, trying to uh, give them uh, informal educations, both in terms of math, physics, English. There is a world beyond that uh, that we are trying to tell them. We. Uh, so far, uh, touch wood, we haven't seen um, uh, any consistent trend of radicalization. We, we are keeping a strong tap on that. We have also been uh, a little conservative in allowing some of the international NGOs to go and function there. I'll not name, at least there's two, three international NGOs who didn't have a very good re track record in that uh, part of the uh, world. We have asked them not to be in Cox's Bazaar, but they can be anywhere in Bangladesh except Cox's Bazaar. So that is the other way of uh, keeping a tap. We, we, we hope that uh, Bangladesh should be able to uh, contain uh, uh, any uh, spread of radicalization uh, in that part. But that remains a huge challenge. The longer they stay, the longer they are confined, the longer they uh, they have they become hopeless. The more uh, chances of either leaving the uh, uh, Cox's Bazaar by boat for uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, uh, or uh, 
or trying to do something to change their uh, present and the future. Great, thanks. Take another round. Um, a lot of questions. We'll take a take a bunch if you don't mind. Let's go back back here to Sally there, uh, and then and then right behind you too. Thank you, Doctor Abdul Haq. Uh, I wanted to say your name because you wanted us to do that. <laughs> Shahid, you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Shahid the martyrs. Mm -hmm. um, I am very uh, informed on the situation of the Rohingya people. Actually, in 2015, we did hold an event, my organization. It's the International Federation for Peace and Sustainable Development. We held an event here with uh, some uh, religious organizations as well. And we brought the Rwenji people here, plus some of the other people who are in concern, and to see how we can help. My question is that this has been going on for so many years, and it's gotten worse and worse and worse. Now, of course, they still call it ethnic cleansing and not genocide, which if in definition it fits. But also because of uh, the, there is a lot of assets and wealth that is from that particular area. So how can you divide between what is legitimate, what is, oh, it's all illegitimate, but how could you separate and make sure that these people have some rights without infringing on others? And how do we focus in saying it is not because of their religion, but it's a combination of both. Thank you. And that, you can just pass it right behind you there. Yeah. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you for a very informative and interesting presentation. Um, I have a quick question. Um, there's been a lot of focus on the humanitarian um, development nexus within the UN in the last couple of years. And I was just wondering uh, what um, what role this nexus could play in the in the process going forward with the Myanmar situation, and what actors would play what roles? Thank you. So, did you give us your name and affiliation? Sir? Oh yeah, Ingrid, yeah. Um, and in turn with the secretariat. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll go here to the middle, and then come over here to the first row. Thank you, Excellency, and good afternoon to you and to all uh, uh, the audience. Uh, I'm Tariq from the Mission of Egypt. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for the, the briefing and the, the presentation. It was very useful and <clears throat> needless to say that uh, my government is quite supportive uh, of all efforts uh, exerted and done by uh, the government of Bangladesh in this regard in order to uh, resolve the, the situation. Um, and as you clearly mentioned in your presentation, uh, this is a multidimensional uh, problem. And this issue has not only the humanitarian uh, dimension, which is uh, catastrophic indeed, but also other dimensions, including the political uh, situation. Um, my question is simply about this uh, uh, issue, the political process. Uh, within the framework of international organizations and uh, regional slash sub-regional arrangements, first of all, the, the United Nations, uh, uh, Security Council and the General Assembly, you, uh, of course, you, you know that uh, there was a um, uh, huge uh, response by the Security Council uh, after the, the crisis started. And last year there was a presidential statement and the Rohingya issue became uh, an agenda item. Uh, what's next? The General Assembly is, uh, we have uh, revived the uh, third committee uh, <laughs> resolution on this issue, um, what's next again? Uh, when it comes to the regional organizations, the organization uh, for Islamic cooperation, there is a, a contact group uh, devoted to the Rohingya uh, issue. Again, I mean, we had a declaration last year during uh, the, uh, the, the high level meeting that was actually uh, chaired uh, or at least uh, attended by uh, Sheikh Hasina the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, and again, I mean, uh, the way forward, what we need is the way forward. Finally, the, the ASEAN and uh, the regional stakeholders, uh, wh wh what do you need from them in order to influence the process? Thank you. 
right? Thank you. There's a lot can, on the table, but if can, you don't can we, mind... Can we take a question? I've, this, this, been, this gentleman here has been yeah. very patiently, so we'll just take one more from here, and then we'll have time for another, another round. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary. For the Secretary, you made an excellent presentation. You could you introduce yourself, sir? Clear. Sir, my, could you introduce yourself? Your name, yeah. yeah. My, na my name is Shudangshu Karmakar. I'm a, I head an NGO called International Committee for Peace and Reconciliation. who are closely associated with the United Nations. I thank you once again for making the excellent presentation. Now my immediate question is that why they are called Rohingyas? Why they are not called Burmese? Okay. So some way they are different from those majority of the people. And it has been complained rightly or wrongly that these people did not, they never integrated with the society. They always remained in an isolated way, lived their life. Is it true? But anyway, the humanitarian problems are tremendous, and Bangladesh is doing best of the ability, and they, these are congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll start with the question as to why um, they're called ringers and not um, uh, not uh, Burmese. Uh, in, in Myanmar, there are 134 plus one ethnic communities. Uh, so uh, uh, that's the multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious country. Uh, I think uh, that's something we, we need to recognize. Now, uh, if you tell Rohingyas that, uh, can we call you Burmese, they will say, we are Rohingyas. And there's a history. I mean, it's not that they have all of a sudden found themselves uh, uh, under that title, but uh, they have a uh, long uh, thousands years back history where they used to have a kingdom, the Arakan kingdom. I'll not go into the history. I will only say, if I want uh, to be uh, called as Bengali, I have the right to say that. If I want to call them myself as an American, I have the right to uh, do so. That's the fundamental rights of human beings. So if they have the, they should ha also have the right to be called themselves as a Rohingya. That's not a crime. Is that a crime? What is the problem for a state to accept it? So that's my questions. Yes, there has been uh, integration issues, and this is not the only country where we have integration issues. We have integration issues all over the world. It's the state responsibility to take extra step to get them integrated. But if you look at the history and, you know, uh, uh, written by uh, even uh, the Burmese people, you will see there has been a consistent effort to discriminate, discriminate them over the years. So that's why uh, uh, the problem. On the uh, issue of um, a colleague from the Egypt, thank you very much, both uh, for support, both um, in terms of assistance and also politically. Uh, it, is, it is a multidimensional uh, uh, problem. And when we were faced with it, we knew that the various dimensions would be manifested at different stages of, uh, of the problem, of the crisis. Uh, you know, the, the whole world seems to be a little volatile, eh? both in terms of politics and in terms of uh, economics. And uh, those who are closely watching televisions, uh, uh, you know what I'm uh, saying. Uh, and that all of a sudden that part of the world has become a little more volatile than it used to be. So, uh, so that's there. And any population movement, in fact, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, the international community has to understand uh, as to how our Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina personally supervised this movement. These people, think of a situation, these people could have walked into Cox's Bazaar and decided to, to continue to walk. Eh? Taking the example of the flow in Europe and spread, trying to cross over Bangladesh border to go somewhere else, all directions. What would have happened? So that is why I think Bangladesh, under the leadership of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, has been able to manage the uh, flow of people 
very nicely. Otherwise, the whole region could have been destabilized on that very moment. Uh, in terms of UN, uh, uh, you are uh, you know better than I do. I, I don't. Uh, you, you live here. Um, we are looking at all options, including Geneva Human Rights Commission, uh, uh, because we think that only international pressure could make Myanmar government give uh, these Rohingyas back their rights, which they are entitled to as a human being. On the ASEAN, uh, as you know, the ASEAN has a policy of non-interference in the internal matter of another country. But despite that, we recently see under the chairmanship of Singapore uh, a, a, a shift in, in looking at, uh, uh, in general, human rights issues within the ASEAN country, and especially uh, on the Rohingya issue. I'm told that there are discussions in-house among them as to what they should do because uh, this is also uh, uh, creating uh, difficulties for ASEAN as, as a community. Uh, on the issue of uh, uh, humanitarian issues and, and development, or very precisely human rights versus development, uh, I, uh, I will restrain myself in making a comment on that, I would only uh, indicate that UN, as, as UN, uh, should be more careful at the country level not to mix up rights with development. You cannot have development without rights and vice versa. So if UN thinks that in a particular country they would go for development and at a later stage rights will come, then they have to look at the history of UN where they have made disasters for themselves and for the country. I hope that's a, enough indication. Um, on the issue of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, I will not use the word, the G, uh, I, I think uh, there are uh, agencies, there are uh, NGOs who are already collecting uh, evidences uh, in that line. Uh, it takes uh, uh, meticulously uh, uh, data collections. Uh, let's see if uh, it has uh, happened. I think the, uh, the world will see. It's a question of time. It takes time especially when there's a very limited access to the place of occurrence. So we had it now. Did you, no, no, okay. uh, over here to the right. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm from Australia. I'm an intern with the DFS. Um, firstly, thank you um, both for today and also to Bangladesh for carrying this burden. Um, being from Australia, I am saddened by our lack of mobility on the issue. I'm probably not alone in that. Um, I had a kind of a twofold question. I was just wanting confirmation, I guess, or clarity on um, where the citizen citizenship question is um, in terms of the the Myanmar government's recognition of their citizenship and their responsibility um, in this whole uh, mess. So uh, to what extent do you feel that more needs to be done in, for, by them in recognition of this crisis? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, standing here in the back. No. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Josephine. I work with the Peace Building Support Office, but also spent the past five years living and working in, in Myanmar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, and, and okay. in Rakhine, so working with this issue quite closely. Um, the, um, 
solution in many ways needs to come from Myanmar and, and Myanmar addressing this problem. And to the extent that you can share with us, it would be very interesting to hear uh, in terms of Bangla Bangladesh negotiation with Myanmar, where is the Myanmar government more open for, um, or what are the interests of the Myanmar government where we could potentially find some entry points to work more with the Myanmar government on this and also uh, multilaterally as well as bilaterally through Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come here in the second row, Michael. And then uh, got you back in. Thanks very much, uh, Foreign Secretary. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm the DPR of Canada. Um, I'd like to also express our appreciation for everything that Bangladesh has done uh, for the Rohingya. And um, um, we have also been uh, trying to help. Uh, our special envoy was recently there, and I appreciate uh, your receiving. My question is similar to the last. You spoke of pressure on the government of Myanmar. Um, what's your advice? How can we all work harder? Uh, what's the points of dialogue? And uh, what are the messages that we need to be delivering? Thank you. Great. Thank you. One more, yeah, there. No? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the, the microphone again. It's Ingrid from the Secretariat again. Um, I, the during your presentation, you <laughs> mentioned how is it on? I think so. You mentioned how there's a uh, majority of uh, women and children in Cox's Bazaar right now. Uh, so I was just wondering, what do you see as uh, women's role in this conflict and in the uh, process going forward? Because they're such a majority. Thank you. Good. Um, thank you. On the issue of citizenship, you know, the uh, most of the Rohingyas were citizens of Myanmar till uh, 1982. In fact, there was no issue before 1962 when Myanmar was under a democratic government. In 1962, there was a coup. Military took over. The problem started from that point of the history. But under a lot of um, uh, various kinds of uh, processes, they decided that uh, if this Myanmar, uh, this Rohingya people tell their ethnic or religious or whatever identity as Rohingyas, they will not be the, um, uh, the, uh, the citizen of Myanmar. So they took away the citizenship deliberately in 1982. And they gave a red card. Red card was this kind of a resident permit. Then after two, three years, they took away the resident card, gave them a blue card, white card, all kinds of a card, depending on whatever they think is you belong to. Or, or most of them arbitrarily. This issue came, uh, took up, um, uh, were also considered in the Kofi Annan Commission report. And Kofi Annan said, there's time that Myanmar should review their citizenship provisions. And that is the most uh, sensitive part of the story. People say, you know, uh, the, this time the massacre started in 19, uh, in 25th of August evening. Uh, Yes, late in the middle of the night. And the report was launched in the afternoon. So when the report was launched, uh, the Myanmar military thought uh, that, uh, that they, if this gets through and implemented, then they are in deep trouble. So people say because of that, uh, uh, this uh, mass expulsion of Rohingyas. Uh, Somebody asked me whether I can uh, suggest some entry points. Uh, I thought I represent Bangladesh. I don't represent Myanmar. And I don't know what is their entry point, uh, if there is one. Uh, but uh, but uh, once I retire and I have, an, I have an ambassador, Sufi Rahman, we decided both of us will write a book on our experience of negotiating with Myanmar. Uh, and that time, uh, you, you, will, you will see that. But it's is very uh, frustrating, it's very difficult, uh, but it's also uh, quite, uh, quite a challenge to, to, to read uh, a Myanmar government's mind towards their own people. Uh, and, the, uh, and the frustrating part is that they're getting away with it, and this is not the first time they're getting away with it. They have been uh, like this for ages, and they have survived. Uh, survive pretty well. You you know you have been you have been there. Uh, we talk about uh, North Korea, talk about other countries. 
not much about her. So, uh, in Canada, thank you very much for both your financial support uh, and also political support. There has been a number of uh, visitors from Canada. Um, uh, we, we think the only way Myanmar government will understand the gravity of the situation when they hear it from the international community. And, and that is the only opening that we have. It cannot be purely bilateral. And that's why we have kept bilateral and multilateral together. In the past, we did not do it. But the situation has changed for them. So, uh, so that's why it is so important uh, that the international community continue to remind them that they can't get away with it. Uh, majority of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the refugees are women and children. Uh, and uh, so where are the men? Some disappeared. Mm. Huh? That's a big question. Where are the men? And if you go and talk to them, they will tell you the story. At least some of them. Because the men, the moment they wanted to leave, they were, the life was threatened. So they let the women and children go. And the men, some of them eventually joined them, some of them couldn't. What has happened to them? Look at Amnesty International support. Hmm. Yeah. We have a uh, space for just a couple more brief questions. We can start here. And there's not. Good afternoon. Um, my name is David from the from the UK mission to the UN. Um, firstly, I'd like to join others in paying tribute to Bangladesh um, for the um, for the welcome and the support that you provided um, to the refugees. Um, as you know, the UK um, remains uh, committed to um, uh, to finding a solution to the crisis and to um, to supporting um, supporting Bangladesh. And uh, our foreign secretary was um, just in um, Myanmar and in um, and in Bangladesh to deliver that message and to um, find out how we can better provide that support. Um, I said two questions. Um, the first is I'd be interested in your reflections on the Security Council in particular and what you think the role of the Security Council should be um, in tackling this crisis in the future. Um, and the second is um, I, was, I was very struck by the, you know, the high number of children um, in the um, uh, amongst the refugee population, and I'd be very interested to hear how you're um, how you're managing the needs um, of those children, many of whom I'm sure are deeply traumatised by the by the experience, and also in uh, need of education. So a little bit more detail on that would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, in the back there, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Ajechi. I'm from Singapore, and also with the uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. So um, earlier you mentioned the desire of a lot of refugees to return to Burma. So my question really concerns uh, the rest of the refugees. Has the Bangladeshi government considered long-term options for um, a lot of refugees who see no future really in returning to Burma? Thank you. Great. I think there's no more questions. Great. OK, we've exhausted yeah. uh, the room. Well, thank you very much uh, to the distinguished colleague from UK. Absolutely. Uh, during your chairmanship to the Security Council, we have seen a lot of efforts. We appreciate it. That also helped uh, to rethink uh, uh, Myanmar to how, how, how they can more positively engage with Bangladesh in terms of bilaterally settling it peacefully. Uh, our expectation for the Security Council, for obvious reason, was very high. Uh, but we knew that uh, it will be difficult, and it, it is difficult. Uh, so. We are also now looking at uh, beyond Security Council. Um, yes, you're, I, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, Mr. Boris Johnson. Very interesting, very bright, very uh, uh, committed uh, foreign secretary. I have never met uh, one such foreign secretary. Uh, he sat down with the, with the Rohingyas, uh, talked to them, uh, you know, making uh, all kinds of uh, jokes uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and trying to find out why they are there, because they are the new arrivals. Uh, and, uh, and so it is, uh, and also we, we saw his commitment uh, uh, to the issue. Uh, in terms of long-term options, uh, you know, Bangladesh is a political entity. Huh? Every state is a political entity. 
at the end, uh, it is uh, it is domestic politics uh, and uh, uh, elections all comes into play. Although, uh, as, a, as as someone who has always been uh, promo suggesting that we shouldn't do two things with any population movement. First, don't politicize it, and don't secretize it. I've been all along saying it. When it came to implementing that, it was the greatest challenge that I've ever faced in my life. Keep the whole Rohingya issue, which is basically a forced population movement, out of politics of Bangladesh. And I have, I've done it to some extent. I've been successful, not always. The other one, don't securitize it. Don't think it's a security issue. That has been a bigger challenge from Bangladesh. So still I believe that you can resolve any population movement related issues without securitizing it, without politicizing it. The moment you do it, then it becomes a very difficult cocktail to solve. It's quite dangerous for the, for the people for whom you possibly are attempting to bring some relief or make a difference in their life. So we still believe and I'm very happy with our uh, current government and the prime minister uh, who has understood this and, and made it uh, above politics and above security issues. But at the same time, we keep a strong eye when it comes to the border management and securities, because on the other side of the border, they have laid landmines, very fresh landmines. Mm. So we have to be careful that uh, no provocation can lead Bangladesh to that direction. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. Very good Thank questions. You. Thank you. Um, let me just uh, echo our, our colleagues from uh, the UK, Canada, and France for the gratitude for Bangladesh's openness to receiving the refugees. I think at a time when uh, the international community is negotiating a global compact on refugees and migration, others is an important example. Uh, I fear this issue will be with us for some time, and so we look forward to uh, welcoming you back uh, for further briefings, and we'll be paying attention closely. So thank you very much again. Thank, thank you. you.